Mr. President, thank you very much indeed. Ambrose Bierce, that wonderful Yankee satirist who disappeared in the Mexican Revolution, once observed that war is God's way of teaching Americans geography. <laughs> he might equally have said that war is God's way of teaching the disaster of human history. And uh, that is the... Uh, uh, that is because the so-called great man or big beasts uh, have all too often led their nations into disastrous conflicts, frequently out of their own egotistical pride. Edward Gibbon defined history as the register of the crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind. Um, he might... <coughs> We may instinctively dislike the great man theory of history, but that does not mean that it is entirely without truth or that it is now obsolete. In addition to the insulting and inaccurate implication that women cannot be great leaders, uh, they are in fact and also much less likely to be misled by the heroic and narcissistic narratives so favored by kings and dictators. The key question about the theory is pretty straightforward. Can one person change history, thus affecting the lives of millions? As Professor Damid McCulloch of this parish put it, the assertion that individuals can single-handedly kickstart a radical change of direction in the tide of human affairs seems so obvious as to be hardly worth asserting. Take away Chinggis Khan and a good many people in medieval Central Asia go on living a lot longer. How many examples are needed to prove the point? The rise and fall of empires from ancient times depended on the ambitions and military talents of a single individual. The Archimedes king of kings in Persia, Cyrus the Great, Darius the Great, Xerxes the Great, and then of course, Alexander, uh, Hannibal, Charlemagne, and Genghis Khan, all achieved massive changes through conquest. Of course, in those days, a junior member of the dynasty, the spare, stood a better chance of seizing power by assassinating uh, the heir, but their likelihood of being bumped off preemptively uh, was far higher. Harry, you don't know how lucky you are. <laughs> in our insular way, we tend to forget that, uh, uh, or to ignore European history uh, in the early modern era in little more than a century, mainly the 17th century. The Swedish Empire was created by Gustavus Adolphus in the Thirty Years' War, and then lost by Charles XII when he invaded Russia in the Great Northern War and was defeated at Poltava. This has usually been recognized as one of the decisive battles of the world, if only because Peter the Great's victory there forged the Russian Empire. Charles XII, on the other hand, as Voltaire failed to record in his book on the monarch, learned how to make Turkish meatballs after he escaped to Ottoman territory. And they became known as Swedish meatballs in one of the most flagrant examples of culinary and cultural appropriation. <laughs> but to return to the great man theory, we have only to pose counterfactual questions to see that an individual leader can change the course of history, not just of their own country, but of a whole continent or more. What would Europe have looked like without Napoleon? We simply cannot tell. The ramifications are infinite. Another obvious one, which we've already covered this evening, which is out and agree, let's take Hitler and the origins of the Second World War. The reworking of frontiers at Versailles after the First World War with the division of ethnic communities, was probably bound to lead to some sort of conflict in Central Europe. But just one man was responsible for the extent of the Second World War and its character of mass annihilation and cruelty. When you have a leader with messianic tendencies who commands the most effective army on the continent and who is absolutely longing for a war then how can you avoid it? In the autumn of 1938, Hitler was even furious 
that Chamberlain's unexpected demarche returning to Munich meant that he was deprived of the opportunity to invade Czechoslovakia with his rearmed Wehrmacht. Of course, individuals alone have not created history. Threats to food or energy supplies have played their part in leading to revolution and war. So have differences over religion and its 20th century uh, successor political ideology. In the last half century, we've seen a traditional collective version of history, or the top-down version, becoming divided into an increasingly wide range of sub-disciplines. Economic, anthropological, gender, cultural, scientific, legal, the list is almost endless. And I would be the first to admit that the great man's theory was probably truer in the past than it is today. And this is because in the globalized world, national sovereignty has been reduced both economically and politically. The turning point came shortly, towards the, shortly before the end of the 20th century. The end of the Cold War with the collapse of the Soviet Union accompanied a decline in collective loyalties and a rise in the cult of the individual. It was striking that in this country, for example, alone, uh, the loss of trade union power uh, matched the decline of the traditional officer class. At the same time, we experienced a, an economic free-for-all uh, following Big Bang and the end of exchange controls, a rapid advance in communications technology with the invention of the internet intensified price competition across the world. It also meant that both the purchase of labor at the cheapest price and the recruitment of business leaders at vast salaries became global. I think it might take historians quite a long time to work out to what degree all of these changes within such a short period of time were coincidental or interdependent. It's also ironic the way that journalists often ask why there are no great statesmen today. Why are there no Churchills, no de Gaulle's, no Adonais? And the answer is the vastly increased influence of the media. Politicians are constantly looking anxiously over their shoulder and lurching from one news management crisis to another. That eccentric reactionary Peregrine Worsthorn, after being fired from the Sunday Telegraph in 1997, wrote how when he'd started as a young journalist soon after the war, one would approach a member of the cabinet almost on bended knee and say, Minister, would you be prepared to share your thoughts with us on, your, on this subject? Yet in stark contrast, uh, by the time of the Thatcher premiership, it was ministers who wanted to join the Beefsteak Club so that they could rub shoulders with newspaper editors, hoping to improve their newspaper profile and coverage. In a discussion about the swing in power from uh, uh, politicians to the media, I mentioned this to the French uh, veteran anchorman Jean-Claude Narcy, and he replied with a typically uh, Gallic shrug, well, in France, ministers make sure that their mistress is a journalist. Um, that response, it must be emphasized, was in 2009, before Me Too finally started to hit the French political class. The great man theory has also influenced political leaders today in other dangerous ways. They and the mass media still cannot resist the temptation to dramatize the importance of a particular crisis by making comparisons to the Second World War. It was a war like no other, and yet it has come to define our idea of war itself. In moments of turmoil, people are, of course, tempted to look back, but history can never be a predictive mechanism. We must watch out when political leaders and the media are tempted to indulge in misleading historical parallels with foreign dictators almost always cast in the role of uh, of Hitler. I once asked a very distinguished psychiatrist who was fascinated by the Second World War how he would define Hitler and Stalin. After making the usual qualifications about uh, the dangers of analyzing people you've never met, he replied that Stalin was almost certainly a paranoid schizophrenic. But in the case of Hitler, all you could say was that he had a personality disorder. 
I didn't feel that I'd advanced very much uh, further as far as understanding Hitler was concerned. Even in this new globalized and supposedly more democratic world, the great man theory is unfortunately still alive and well, especially in autocracies such as Russia and China. Look at the effect of Vladimir Putin's obsession with rebuilding the Russian empire and President Xi Jinping's uh, with Taiwan and the restoration of Chinese pride. The power of the so-called great man is not limited to military conquest as in the past. It can also extend today to those leaders who can toxify politics by encouraging and exploiting fear and hatred, the Trumps, the Orbans, the Milosevic's. In fact, almost all populist authoritarians have fermented hate, almost, uh, which is now as easy to do through social media, where intellectual honesty is the first casualty of moral outrage. When weaponized, it becomes an extension of war by other means. As Dahmed McCulloch also said, one person at a vulnerable moment in the society's history can seize a mood and crystallize it so that decent folk discover that they can behave in thoroughly reprehensible ways and while the spell lasts, glory in their vicious folly. Such examples tempt one to modify the big beast concept into the right bastard theory of history. So sadly for humanity, we must recognize that the great man theory of history really does exist. And I urge you on the grounds of simple logic, not emotion, to vote against the proposition. Thank you very much. <laughs>